Hear the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. When the chief priests and Pharisees had heard the parables, they realised that Jesus was speaking about them. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what they said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us, then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor, or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this, and whose title? They answered, The Emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the Emperor the things that are the Emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So please be seated. Last week we heard the parable of the wedding invitations and how it's rather odd. You would have thought if people received a wedding invitation they'd probably be happy about it, or at least indifferent. But to actually be angry with the messenger seems a bit odd. But nevertheless, in the last week's parable, some people obviously went to the wedding and others either pretended not to be interested or else they actually attacked the messengers, the people bringing the letters of invitation. And we were invited to participate in the story, to think, well, would we like to go to the wedding feast of the Lamb? Would we be messengers? Would we attack the people coming to invite us and that kind of thing? And the obvious thing is that Jesus is inviting us to be with him. And he's inviting us to something like a party, which seems quite nice to me. In the end of the Thessalonians reading today, it says another aspect of this invitation from Jesus. He says, Hey, you turned from God to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. And the wrath that is coming is the wrath of God, the anger of God, over all the evil on the world. All the evil in the world that one day he will destroy and vanquish forever. And the invitation is that we should leave that evil so that when he comes to destroy it, we shan't be part of it. So that when he destroys it, we shall be separated from it and therefore delivered from it. And that idea of that relationship to God is the thing which Paul calls most precious. And that is kind of what Jesus is meaning, I think, with this parable of the coins, of paying taxes to Caesar. This whole idea of give to Caesar what is Caesar, or give to the emperor what is the emperor's, and give to God what is God's, forms the, the kind of curious idea that the church, the state, are, if you like, necessarily separate. I read a book about secularism from a secularist and he was talking about the sort of secularist ideals and how the secularist ideals came about and everything and basically he acknowledges that the whole concept of secularism, the idea of the state being somehow separate from the church, is actually an idea that comes from Christianity, oddly enough, but it's an idea that's rooted in this very parable, the idea that somehow the church and the state are separate. The church meaning the thing which describes our relationship to God and the state meaning the thing which actually organises and administers the physical affairs in the place where we live. And Jesus' main point here is that our relationship to God is not affected one way or the other by whoever receives our taxes. So in other words, it doesn't actually matter from an eternal point of view it doesn't actually affect our souls in any way whatsoever 
Who receives our taxes? It doesn't actually affect us in our relationship to God. In other words, if the idea of our relationship to God is important to us, you might say that therefore the things which we do which will influence that relationship are important things. And that's basically the difference between good and evil. Things that are good will help us in our relationship with God. And things that are evil will hinder us or harm us in our relationship with God. And if good and evil are real, then they'll actually hinder us or harm us in a very real way. Not just in our relationship to God, they'll actually harm us in other ways as well if they're evil. And if they're good, they'll benefit us in different ways, as well as helping us in our relationship to God. Because that's how we're made. And the idea of this, these taxes is that it doesn't actually make any difference who receives them. So from that point of view, it doesn't actually matter on our consciences whether the people we're giving them to are any good or not. And you might think that when Jesus actually said this, the emperor in question was actually Tiberius. Tiberius, who was the adoptive son of Augustus, Caesar, who by all accounts was not a particularly nice man. He was a competent general, and I think a reasonably competent administrator, but he was not a pleasant person at all. <laughs> and he didn't exemplify many Christian virtues, certainly. So, you know, the one that we're talking about, when you're talking about the, the government, or the king, or the emperor, or whoever, they don't actually need to be good people for us to give our taxes to them. If you like, it's not in our consciences whether they're good or not. And I suppose an illustration of that is that when I lived under Robert Mugabe, I prayed for him as the head of state, and I paid taxes when they were due, as a lawful and upright citizen, but knowing full well that the government was corrupt, it was despotic, it was tyrannical, it was violent, it was incompetent, and it was a functionally useless. I mean, basically everything that governments are supposed to do, it didn't really do, so... But nevertheless, from a, a spiritual point of view, actually, that's not my problem. It really... It makes no difference to my soul at all. It does make a difference to my soul if I hate people, if I despise them, and it does make a difference if I, if you like, if I'm lawless and rebellious. I was cautioned on the way in today about speeding, <laughs> and this obviously is quite challenging at times when you see a sort of point the speed limit. But broadly speaking, I'd advocate well keep the speed limit because it's kind of good for the soul to be a law-abiding citizen. But ultimately, whoever collects the fine, if you do end up breaking it, doesn't actually affect your soul in the least. So there we go. The other thing which is kind of alluded to in these readings is that even though Tiberius wasn't a very nice man and wasn't in the least bit interested in God, as we would know God, he was there in some way by God's will. The Lord somehow was over him and somehow it's part of God's purpose that he was emperor. And this is said more explicitly in the reading from Isaiah, where this Cyrus, who they're talking about, he was the man that eventually became the ruler of the Persians. He vanquished all his rivals in Persia, the various regions known as Medea and Elam. He then conquered the whole empire as far as what we now call um, Turkey, Anatolia it used to be called. And he then ended up invading and conquering the, the Babylonian Empire and everything else. And eventually ruled an enormous area, all the way from what we'd now call India, all the way to Egypt. Had a huge empire. And that kind of irresistible spread of Cyrus' power is described in the beginning of this reading from Isaiah. And some people put this as meaning that this passage must have been written after it happened. But it actually speaks of it as something in the future. And other people would say, well, God can predict the future, or God knows what he intends. And the whole purpose of this passage is to reassure the readers that the spread of Cyrus' power is actually something which God has decided upon. 
for this irresistible spread of his empire as something which God is somehow behind. That God somehow has a plan for this. But that plan is for his servant Jacob and Israel his chosen. But somehow the readers of this passage are supposed to take heart that when they see the irresistible spread of this enormous empire, this seemingly indefeatable king, this incredible sort of ruler who seems to be able to let nothing stop him get in his way, that somehow this whole thing is happening for the benefit of his people. And he reiterates, he says, you know, about Cyrus, he says, I call you Cyrus by your name, I know you, though you do not know me. You know, there's no implication that somehow Cyrus knows the Lord, or that Cyrus is even conscious of this. Cyrus has no idea about any of this. Nor had Tiberius, no interest in it. And it was no vindication of their good character either. It was simply the Lord's decision that this needed to happen. And the Lord makes this plain. He says, I am the Lord, there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. He says, from the rising of the sun to the west, there is no other God besides me. I am the Lord, there is no other. I form light and create darkness. And one of the kind of symbolisms of that, one of the significances of that, is that in the ancient times, they used to think that somehow there was two contesting powers, light and dark. And the Lord has just said, they're not contesting, I simply made them both. He said, I make real and I create woe. In Hebrew it reads, I, literally, I do peace and I create disaster. He makes well, he makes things go wrong for people. I, the Lord, do these things. He sets himself above everything. But the whole intention of this passage is to reassure his people that he, the Lord, who is above all these things, who raises up the rulers and casts them down again, he has got them in his mind. Or to put it to us, as we see the powers rise and the powers fall, he has us in his mind. And he wants to reassure us that we don't need to worry about the, the rising and the falling of these powers, because he has us in his mind, and his plan for us is undisturbed by them. It's even part of his plan for us, his people. And that we don't need to worry about who they are, because they will not affect our souls or our spirits in the slightest. It simply will not touch us. And therefore what he wants from us is simply that we regard him for who he is. That he is the one who will judge the earth. And he will hold all according to account for what they've done. And so he wishes to set us free, if you like, from the burdens of these things. To reassure us that we can have confidence in him and not be afraid or overly concerned about the rising and the falling of these powers and things. That we can worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, that the whole earth can tremble before him. And so at the end of, of the reading a couple of weeks ago, we had that lovely thing, fear not, little father. And that's what I think the Lord would want us to know. Fear not, little flock. Because your Father, it's your good Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He knows what you need. And he has you in his mind. So don't be afraid. And don't be disturbed. And do what is right. And the Lord will bless you. Amen.